For a few months, I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black, greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching, he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite-sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it, letting him slip inside, only to possibly infest my home with blood-sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down, and he pranced towards it, scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer through his long fur and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone, and his cheeks looked sunk in, causing his eyes to protrude out grossly. It was then that I noticed his tar-colored eyes that had no glint to them, no shine from the setting sun. It reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine, but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though, seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. 
After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard, and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused, and my eyes widened. Suddenly, I was no longer groggy, and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me, and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me, and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked, and I could feel my body growing hot as my heart beat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence, and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed, completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rubbed my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French press coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me, but to my dismay, it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer looking for solutions to my problem. Of course, I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me, and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door 
to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave, showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs, with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked. Taking me to the guest room downstairs, she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed. After refusing to tell her what went wrong, I felt crazy after what I saw. Part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy. A few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease. My sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there as I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat. I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't have come. I knew I shouldn't have accepted the dare. Well, I couldn't back down from a double dare, could I? My name is Jacob, but my friends call me Jake. My friends had dared me to come here at midnight to prove I wasn't a pussy. There was no way I could back down from a double dare, as everyone would know I was a coward. My friends and I were in the woods near our town, just messing around, you know, teenage stuff. Our parents had always warned us to stay away from the woods as anything could happen in there. Of course, we didn't listen to them. We were 15 and we thought we knew better than them, as every teenager does. Our town's woods are like any town's. Parents warn us not to go in as a child, leading us to create fantastical tales about creatures living in the woods who only come out at night with the body of a deer and torso of a man, with unicorns and dragons living in the deepest of the green utopia when the sky turns into an inky black. Of course, we outgrew all of these childish creations and fantasies, and we grew up to enjoy the woods, often going in there to enjoy a sneaky smoke or to take their new girlfriend away from the prying eyes of their parents. We had entered the woods at just about 4 p.m. It was autumn, and the clouds were hanging low over the treetops, looking pregnant and black, threatening to burst and shower us in heavy rain that had been expected for weeks now. My friends, Sam and Archie, were with me. Archie is my best friend. Ever since we met in second grade, we had gotten on like a house on fire, and now we were practically inseparable. Sam was a big dude, towering over us at 5 foot 11, at just 15 years old. He was the guy you always wanted on your side when you got into a fight. 
Me and Sam didn't get on this very well. We had only met through a friend of a friend type thing and had never really bonded well. Sam was doing his usual bragging about the stuff he's got up to last night with his girlfriend that we all knew were just over-exaggerated fantasies. We had just arrived at the clearing. That was its name. Everyone just called it the clearing. It was exactly that, a clearing in the center of the woods with a large boulder in the center that as kids, when we walked through the woods with our parents, we would climb to the top and yell funny phrases from our favorite cartoon at the time. We walked where the boulder was at and our conversation tuned towards movies. We had all recently seen a horror movie together and were just making comments at how we each saw the other flinch at certain scenes. Both Sam and Archie were claiming that I was the only one who jumped the most. And of course, like any testosterone driven teen, I was on the physical defensive immediately. Jokingly pushing Archie off the rock and kicking him lightly. They both talked about how I was always a pussy when watching horror movies. Always jumping at every shadow after the movie too. One thing led to the other and before I knew it, I had been dared to prove that I wasn't the coward they were claiming I was. I had to stay in the woods with them until midnight and then they would leave me alone for an hour to see how long I would last in the dark woods on my own. I was hesitating to accept it there, thinking of my parents and stuff and it being a school night. But then Archie went and double dared me. You can't decline a double dare. I had to accept the challenge. We hung around waiting for midnight to come. They continued their conversations, but I couldn't get involved. I was far too nervous, dreading the moment I would be left alone in these dark woods. They had promised me they wouldn't be too far off and that they wouldn't be able to hear my girly screams, quote Sam, if I got too scared and wanted out of it. It wasn't the dark I was going to be scared of. It was what was unseen in the dark that worried me the most. My hands were shaking and I couldn't stop my breathing rate to increase as the minutes ticked down to midnight. Just 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes, and then an hour standing in the pitch black woods in the clearing. Proving to my friends I wasn't a coward, was it worth it? I asked myself. I didn't know to live for the rest of my friendship with them, being called a pussy, or to stand through 60 minutes of sheer terror and dread. Damn it. I shouldn't have watched so many scary movies. My mind was a blur. My vision couldn't focus. I kept seeing things in the corner of my eye. Shadows behind trees that moved out of sight when I turned my full attention on them. Footsteps behind me. I knew it was all my imagination though. Just my imagination. Hey, Archie's voice cut through the mist in my mind. A deer. I squinted through the darkness in the direction he was pointing. Where? I heard Sam ask. Shh, you'll scare it away, Archie hissed. He gestured with his hand to the left side of the boulder, middle distance. And sure enough, there was a deer. It was standing still, absolutely stock still. It wasn't grazing the grass, it was looking around for possible dangers or predators. It was just standing there, with its head pointed straight, looking east. It's beautiful, ain't it? Archie said, smiling at me. I nodded, my mouth still dry with nervous anticipation. 
I pulled out my phone to check the time to see how long I had left before I was left alone in these woods. But Archie stopped me, grabbing my hand and shaking his head. No, he whispered. The light from the phone might scare it away. I put the phone away and squinted through the darkness again at the still, motionless deer. We stood there for a few minutes, watching it. It hadn't moved once. Yo, why isn't it moving? Sam asked. Then the deer moved. I saw it. Just as Sam had said those words in his deep whisper, the deer turned its head to look at us. I felt a shiver go down my spine. I don't know why, but the way it had turned its head to look at us didn't seem right. The movement wasn't fluid. It wasn't like the deer was afraid of the noise and had whipped its head around to check it out. The deer had turned its head too slowly, too slowly for an animal of prey, hearing an unknown sound. It stared at us, we stared at it, and nobody moved. The woods were silent. It was as if the trees and animals were all holding their breath in anticipation of what was about to occur next. It then moved again, so slowly, so unnaturally, and slowly, it started to walk. I don't know if walk is the right way to describe its movements, actually. It was more forced, as if its legs didn't belong to it, and it was trying to figure out how to use its limbs along the way. Jerky and slow movements, moving away into the darkness until the blackness surrounded it and we could no longer see it. None of us said anything for a long time. Sam turned to us. He ruined it. Of course he would. Enough of that weird ass deer. We're here for a reason, right? I could do nothing but stare at him. My heart beating so fast in my chest and my head swimming with thoughts. Archie didn't respond. Well, Sam demanded. Archie looked at me. I couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed me. I was scared of what I had just witnessed and the strangeness of it and the fear of the dare. Archie then shrugged at me. A dare is a dare, bro, was all he said to me. Taking out his phone, he checked the time. 12.03 a little over midnight. Well, Archie began, but Sam cut in. Come on, let's get to it. It's bloody freezing out here. He pulled down his beanie further on his head and sipped up his coat higher. Do the dare and let's get home where it's warm, all right? I nodded. I couldn't believe myself. I actually nodded. Despite all my internal senses going haywire, all of my gut telling me that this was the complete and wrong thing to be doing. I had nodded, sealing the dare and confirming my participation. The dare was on. They promised me they wouldn't be too far away, that they would be near the creek at the west entrance of the woods, about 100 meters away from the clearing I was in. Then they left me, left me all alone, alone in the dark, alone in the unknown, alone with who knows what. I silently cursed myself. I tried to control my breathing. My heart was hammering in my chest. I let out a sigh, watching as my breath vapor steamed the cold air in front of my face. I just had to make an hour, one hour, 
one hour, I walked to the boulder and leaned against it and waited and waited. And that's where I am right now, still waiting. I actually shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't. I let out a sigh, taking out my phone, squinting at the sudden bright light of the display. I checked the time. 12.42, just 18 minutes. Time was going slowly. A loud noise interrupted me from my self-pitying thoughts. The sound of a twig snapping. Someone was moving near me. My eyes were wide, darting around trying to pierce the inky blackness of where my natural night vision couldn't see. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. The noise came again, this time from behind me. I spun around, trying to desperately squint through the darkness. I turned on my phone, turned on the flashlight, and shined it through the trees. It was Archie and Sam. I knew it. They were trying to prank me. Try and make me scream. So then they could tell all of their friends that Jake was scared of the dark and was such a coward. My fist clenched tighter around my phone. Archie, Sam, I know it's you. I called out. And the noise came again from my left. I whipped around and saw it. There was a deer standing there looking at me. It was close, like two meters away from me. I could see its coarse fur and its twisting antlers and its eyes. Its eyes were wrong. Its eyes were a deep, dark red. I stepped backwards. Those eyes, they had me transfixed. I couldn't stop staring into them. Then the deer started to move jerky movements towards me. I was frozen in shock. I thought I heard a faint noise in the distance. Some high-pitched noise, but it was for a split second, and I was left wondering if I had imagined it. The deer kept moving towards me, menacing, terrifying. I was paralyzed in fear. My body wanted to move, but I couldn't. All I could do was stand there, as the deer kept stalking towards me so slowly. It wasn't a deer though. It was obvious, the eyes, the way it moved, the way it held its posture. It was clear that this was something else. What it was, I didn't know. It wasn't a deer for sure. Something was inside of it, wearing it, testing it out, and seeing how it worked. My body, then came to life. I had control of my limbs, breaking free of its stare. I turned and fled. I wasn't paying attention to where I was running to, just anywhere from that. That thing, I looked behind me. It wasn't following me. It was standing in the clearing, watching me. I turned back to look where I was going. Too late. I tripped over a log, I think. My knees with pain, pain seared through my left elbow. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain, and looked behind me. The woods were silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my own heartbeat and my heavy breathing. I heard footsteps, pounding footsteps coming towards me. Sam burst through the foliage, panting. It, it, he couldn't speak. His chest was heaving as he struggled to catch his breath. His hair and face was slick with sweat and he had lost his beanie on the run. It got Archie. It freaking got Archie, he managed to say. He noticed my look of confusion. The deer, the freaking deer, there was one there. We were watching it. I turned for a second and, and when I turned back, Sam broke into a hacking sob. He broke down. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. I realized this was the first time I had seen the big guy cry. When I turned back, there were bones on the floor. The deer had gone in, and there was this thing, this freaking ugly ass creature. It, it was horrible, dude. Sam broke down again. 
I could do nothing but stay crouched where I was, shocked out of my wits. It transformed in front of me, dude. It had taken his skin, like in the horror movies, skinwalkers. They take the skins of their victims. More of them freaking deer showed up then, like about five of them, dude. Five of them. Next to the thing wearing Sam's skin, and then I... Sam coughed and spat onto the ground. I ran. Ran like hell, dude. Oh my god. This freaking there. We should have never stayed. His tears stopped coming, and he collapsed onto the log. I was breathing heavily still. I saw a deer too. I managed to whisper. It was in the clearing. I ran, cause it just didn't seem right. If I had stayed, I grounded to a hop. There was a deer walking towards us. Its eyes were red. Run! I yelled, leaping to my feet and grabbing Sam by the arm, dragging him with me. I could hear the deer following us. Then, a loud crunch, and I knew that if I looked back now, it wouldn't be a deer following us. It would be one of those creatures Sam had described. I didn't look back though, just kept running, running and running. Then we got lost. Branches whipped in our face, foliage shredded our trousers. If one of us tripped, the other would simply keep going, dragging the other along with them until they got their pace back. We got split up, I don't even know how. I think there was a tree, and Sam was going around the left of it, but I was going to the right. I let go of his arm for a second, I think. When I looked to where he had been, he wasn't there. I had lost him. I kept running until I couldn't run any further. I staggered to a halt and leaned against a tree trunk, trying to catch my breath back. I took a step forward and heard a little brittle crunch from underneath my shoe. I stepped back and looked down at what I had stepped on. There was something white on the floor. I took my phone out and shined its flashlight on the floor. Bones. There were bones on the floor, shattered by me stepping on them. I shined the light around more. There was a skull near the bushes. I wanted to vomit. This must be all that was left of poor Archie. I sank to my knees, and I started to sob. And I started to cry, uncontrollably, racking, sobs. I fell onto my backside, but felt something underneath me. I sat up and picked it up. It was Sam's beanie. Then it clicked. I span around, and of course, there was Sam. But it wasn't Sam, of course. His pupils were red, and that smile wasn't right. The thing wearing Sam's skin forced Sam's grin even wider, and it said in a deep snarl, I dare you to run. Go on. Double dare. So we end up playing football, dicking around with me. There's the white kid Tanner, five of my cousins, and then four of their friends. In total, there were five girls and six boys. We all were around 15 to 17. We ended up just digging the day away. So we head back to the camp and pulling out some stuff for a campfire. Even though the trailers had kitchens, Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with him since it's going to get dark soon. And one of the girls also wants to tag along. It's about 7 o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights and take the trail to Tan's property. The rest of us chill. We make s'mores, drink, and kiss on the girls. About 30 to 40 minutes later, there's the smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we had started. It was a nasty copper smell like right after you had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dry blood, but it was that nasty metallic 
back of your throat smell kind of. We immediately think it's some kind of electrical malfunction or someone left a hot plate on or some shit like that. We search all the trailers and nothing is on and we can all smell it now. All of a sudden, we can hear people booking down the path towards us and Rooster, Tan, and the girl all come running into the clearing out of breath. And they don't even break stride. They all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. So of course, we all get the fuck out of there and into the trailers we go as well. They end up calming down. Even Rooster is crying his fucking eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is going lower and lower. So my cousins say, fuck it. And they're about to go outside to get the generator out of a shed between the trailers. But then Tanner goes, fuck no, lock the front door. Ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too, and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy, and his pants are dirty as shit. He goes on to tell us that they went up to his house. His father said sure, he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back, and that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles, just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped up, and was half eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they usually don't fuck with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed the stuff and told his dad they would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back to where we were camping at. So Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out the window with a dumb look on her face. He says they had gotten halfway into the woods towards the camp when they started to hear shit in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time so they weren't sure at first what the fuck it was. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail and they all beamed their flashlights over there and there was someone standing back in the woods. Rooster said they shouted at him and told him that he was scaring the fuck out of them and what a dick he was. He says that's when he realized that the guy was actually facing away from them. So they keep walking they say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side and there's a dude standing in the forest backwards slightly closer to the path so now they start power walking and Tan keeps going I should have taken the fucking rifle as they're telling the story the smell is still super strong even inside the cabin they say that after they started walking faster a kind of low gibbering has started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track. And that's when they just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer. So we're out in the fucking woods and we're assuming at this point it's some rednecks or some shit trying to fuck with us. All of a sudden my other cousin Junior starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the goat man or some shit like that. We promptly tell him to shut the fuck up because we don't need any spooky talk right now but he just keeps going on and on about how it's the fucking goat man and how we're in his woods and blah blah blah. At that time, I had never heard of this goat man or any of that. But then a couple years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a native roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a fucking man with the head of a goat and he gets among groups of people to scare them. It's also supposed to be kind of like the Wendigo and it's bad mojo to even talk about it. And it's even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I don't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin starts saying, the goat man's going to get in and fucking get us. The girls are all terrified and my cousins and I are all fucking trying to figure out if it's just some bullshit or some hillbillies. 
or some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Most of the time, smells fade away or just lessen. But in this case, it literally was there one second and then not the second after. So it's after an hour making it around 9 or 10. We stop shitting bricks enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figure it was just some assholes trying to fuck with us. So we don't go back home because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or some crazy shit like that. Nothing else weird happens that night and we stay another night and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. At about 1 in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing their scary story, which I don't remember what it's about, the smell comes back. This time, it's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I then say that we should get inside and this doesn't feel right. In reality, we should have just fucking left. We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man. And my cousin Rooster keeps trying to shut him the fuck up. And all the while I'm just feeling that something is wrong. And I can't figure out what the fuck it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong. And we're terrified and all huddle in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove and give everybody a hot dog. I get mine and after a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another one. He starts grumbling about how I get two brats and everybody else only got one. And I look at him like he's fucking stupid. I tell him that everybody only got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming. Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out. She's crying and shivering, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up what the fuck is wrong. Me and him both glance around the room, and then I feel my heart fucking sink. I run the fuck out of the cabin, and the girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everybody books out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends then ask what the fuck was wrong. I start counting all of us and there's only 11 of us now. I shit you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in the cabin, but being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed the whole fucking time that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I had kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just dicking around having a good time that you don't sweat the smallest shit and you don't always keep track of certain stuff? I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us and that they had been there for at least a fucking day eating with us. What makes it worse is I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person slash the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside. Eventually, we get big ass sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the fuck happened and the girl says that she also realized and that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over towards her and said something she couldn't understand. So we are pretty much scared as fuck as we huddle together, and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up, and half the people are asleep, and the other half are packing our shit up. We all want to walk back home, but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up, and some people think that we're just fucking around and still want to stay there. I just want to get the fuck out of the woods, to be honest. The girl's name was Kiera, the one that the goat man had touched. Anyways, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she says that she just wants to go home, and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decided to split up. The four that want to go can go, 
but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin, and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed off at this point because I feel like people aren't taking the shit seriously, and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, which is now four girls and four guys, to get the fuck out. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back. So now there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m. he hasn't made it back yet and we're getting extremely fucking nervous. And the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to go get a gun. It's about 5.30 p.m. or so when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kiera is outside. We all look outside and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so fucking scared, why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now, I realize I can smell just a little bit of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody. And these are the people that wanted to stay in the fucking woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst. It's laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not fucking bullshitting you all right now. I then demand to know why the fuck would I play like that. So one of the girls goes outside to get Kiera. She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kiera starts heaving. I don't know how the fuck to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September, so it was still fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too. And you could usually hear some big ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit chatting. So I step out of the door and tell her to come back in the fucking trailer. Right fucking now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the fucking door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy then turns to say that she's still there and then there's a huge fucking bang at the door. We all jump the fuck up and scramble around the living room. The banging is super fucking loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the other two are kind of giggling, nervously laughing and me and the other two guys are shitting bricks. Then we hear Tan, he's screaming, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. So we go over to the door and open it and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kiera standing there. When he had gone into the edge of the clearing, she had turned towards him with a slack jaw look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it was until he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move, she had been turning inches closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin, thinking it would open, and when he got to the door, it was locked. He turned, and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room, and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear, you know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside a trailer. While we were out sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day, it has just slipped right back in. We looked out the window, and there is nobody out there, so we recount everyone, and then basically, I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier, and everybody says eight. I then say, well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realize there are only now seven people in the cabin. So Tan had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle. 
and he had told his dad there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was the goat man. He said that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really fucking terrified but I at least feel better because we can be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and prank them and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person and she says, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig or if it's really the goat man? How do we know that this is real? How do we know that this is the real Tanner and that the goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we fucking get into a huge argument about this, where me and Tan are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer, without us knowing and mingling with us, and at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls starts crying and saying that she wants to go home right now, and we're trying to tell her that we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down, and it's getting a little cloudy outside. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we really can't get a station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19 I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon, and he has one of those heavy duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer and we whisper to Tan, asking him if he's sure that's his cousin, and he says, yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figure she would meet up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pants all the way up the trail. We all say at the same time, fucking no, but we ask him what the fuck he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using, and he had come up on one of your guy's buddies, standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him, slack jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then she smiled at him, and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she just continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend in the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. So he assumed that she must have taken a shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on, I half expected him to say we were full of shit, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl, he says, when she had kept trying to lag behind him, it had kind of weirded him the fuck out, so he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little bit behind, and that he smelled this nasty smell and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually, it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch. And when he had turned around, she had been right the fuck upon him. And he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay. And if she wasn't, he would carry her back the rest of the way. But instead, she stayed quiet and just kept staring. He said that's when he reached out for her. As in to grab her on the shoulder. But he must have misjudged the distance because she was off to the side where he had put his hand like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point we know the shit's real unless Tan is playing a joke. Which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles, we eat some more and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this fucking day every time I think about this. I really pray to God that it's not some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed so I would shit for the rest of my life. 
At around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty, gross, blood-like smell. Like cooking blood and hair. Tan and his cousin Reese get the fuck up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knock, half claw at the door. And I shit you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and YouTube dogs whose owners teach them how to, quote, talk. So after the half knocking and half clawing at the door, it says in this weird toned voice, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. It made my fucking nuts creep up against my body. And one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. It was so fucking obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence. And that's some shit that I never realized until that moment. But all the people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This shit didn't have any kind of cadence. One of those YouTube cats, that's what the fuck it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it? Stop fucking around man. And just keep saying, let me the fuck in. For almost about 15 minutes. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. But if you can't imagine how this shit sounded, then you can't imagine how fucked up the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while. And for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods. Every couple of minutes, it comes back into the door and say something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning. Ree says, Man, fuck this and opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away, go away. He fires two more times, but then, from the woods, right up against the river, across from the trailer, there comes this sound, like a slowly gibbering and hooting sound. Then it starts screaming, and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like, I seriously have never heard any shit like that. Reese fires into the tree line, and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and we can hear the shit keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground, and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot at it. But pretty much, that was how the rest of the night went. It was, literally, screaming constantly for the next two hours. And we could hear shit moving out into the tree line, but it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle. Nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realized something was wrong and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the fucking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves. So he just stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing, but then it would lay back down. The story closes pretty weak because from my perspective, nothing happened. We woke up and I noticed that Tan was a little jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us. But we ate some breakfast, packed up and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin, and he would lock up and bring me my uncle's keys to just start walking and he would catch up, which I didn't really want to fucking do. When we got a little bit up the path, and when he came running up, basically, we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was fucking up when he went in there. Now, as you can imagine, 
I'm guessing. It must have been doing that all night, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. As a matter of fact, it walked with us all the goddamn way back to his house. And then he said, it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking back into the woods.